to start formally now. And uh, the goal of today's lecture is to cover the existence of course moduli spaces. This was this is sort of the second lecture of this two-part sequence on the geometry of Deline Mumford stacks, where to remind you, last time uh, we did two things concerning the geometry of Deline Mumford stacks. We discussed quasi-coherent sheaves on Deline Mumford stacks, and then we also covered the local structure theorem of, of Deline Mumford stacks. And then we're gonna put these, we're gonna use this uh, today with the goal of establishing what's known as the Keel Mori theorem which I have up here, that any separated delete Mumford stack admits a coarse moduli space where uh, X is a separated algebraic space. So um, we need to define what, what this means and we'll do that today. And we'll also, we'll, we'll prove the theorem. Um, but I'd like, like always, I'd like to give a quick recap. Um, I'm not gonna really review quasi-coherent sheaves because the only, we, we will use the structure sheaf today, but, but that's all. Um, but we will, we will use in a fundamental way the local structure theorem for Deline Mumford stack. So let me just quickly recall what that is. Uh, this was the theorem that we established last time that if you have a separated Deline Mumford stack uh, and a geometric point, so a point defined over an algebraic, algebraically closed field K, uh, and then, uh, then there's a, a morphism that's affine and a tau uh, from a quotient stack of, of a quotient stack of the action of the stabilizer group scheme on an affine scheme. And it's, it's affine and a tau, and moreover, it induces an isomorphism of stabilizer groups at, uh, a, at the given pre-image y, w, sorry, w of x. Right, and so, um, yeah, this, this is, Right, that's about all I'll say for, for, for review. Uh, we'll use this theorem later, but I, I just, I wanna to get to the core content on coarse moduli spaces. And I think I should begin with a definition. So we define that a map, a morphism X, to y, sorry, uh, x to x is, so in, in this here, x here is an algebraic stack. And this is an, is an algebraic space. We define this to be a coarse moduli space. which we'll ab abbreviate by CMS if, well, the following two, con two conditions hold. First is that you need for all geometric points, so for all algebraically closed fields, you need that the natural map that if I take the K value points of the stack, this is a groupoid. And so I could take the underlying set of equivalence uh, classes of objects. Uh, and then I, I map that maps to the K points of the algebraic space. And I want this to be bijective. And so just this notation here means this is the isomorphism classes of objects in the groupoid. Right, and we're requiring that this map of sets be a bijection for all algebraically closed field K. And the second property is a, a uniqueness, well, ensures uniqueness is that this map pi is universal for maps to algebraic spaces. Uh, right, and maybe let me just spell out exactly what that means. That is, in other words, if you, here I have my morphism pi to x, and if I have any other morphism y, where this is a also an algebraic space, then there's a unique map. Right, so uh, th yeah, this is the definition and, and sort of the, 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 the reason why we care is we sort of view the coarse moduli space X as the closest 
approximation to the stack X, which is an algebraic space. And so somehow there's, a, there's this like trade-off here. So we, by, we, we sort of sacrifice like, you know, the stack X has universal properties. Like for, for instance, you know, there exists a, a universal family. Uh, yeah, you know, for instance, if X is the modulized space of, is, is MG the modulized stack of, of smooth curves, you, 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 uh, you have a universal family, but uh, we, we sort of want to, we trade this off to get an object X, which is more familiar. Well, it's an algebraic space and ideally X is, a, is, is projective. And so the, the, the end goal is, is, to, is to show that your coarse modular space is, 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 well, is projective, at least in the context of MG bar. And uh, the, having, having a coarse modular space, which, which is an algebraic space, is the first step. Uh, right. And, well, and, and the reason, yeah, I mean, maybe you ask, it's a fair question. I think it's already come up. Why, why, would, why do we even care? I mean, if the stack sometimes, most uh, most questions often are, are best answered on the stack itself because yeah, but uh, uh, but the the point here is we associate a more familiar object like hopefully that's, that's projective and then we have more tools because we have the whole toolkit of a projective geometry at our disposal and you can then study you know the projective variety x and then infer properties about the stack if you want anyway that's our goal and uh, the strategy is actually very clear how we're going to prove this. So our strategy to show the existence of a coarse modulized space. Um, well, it's really a two-part case that you handle. First, you handle the special case where that if X is a quotient of an affine scheme mod a finite group, here G is a finite then you need to show that the morphism to the spectrum of the invariance is, uh, is a coarse moduli space. And we, we, yeah, we, we will do this. We'll take, take, take a, yeah, that's one of the fundamental results from today. And then the second part is then, is then to reduce to the special case. So you, then you use the local structure Um, where now you have an arbitrary, you know, delete Mumford stack, and the local structure theorem implies that there's, you know, a nice affine and a tau cover. And this one, by the special case, has a coarse moduli space. And then the goal is to sort of glue these in, in the tau topology. to construct X. All right, that's the strategy. Any, any questions on that? Yes, so why isn't it uh, a scheme? Sorry? So, I mean, uh, so for the special case, uh, uh, the cross model space is a scheme, right? Yeah, in the special case, it's even an affine scheme. And then we glue it together using uh, without topology. Why don't we get the scheme? Oh, because we're we're we're, we're going to glue under an Italo equivalence relation, and we don't know much uh, more about the the properties. Is that uh, yeah? We we're just gonna, we glue an Italo equivalence relation, and uh, it gives us an algebraic space because we're gluing the Italo topology, not the risky topology. And moreover, maybe I, I should point out that in this definition, you know, note that property two uh, implies that the coarse modulized space is, space is unique. And in the special case where you start with an algebraic stack, 
that is an algebraic space, the coarse moduli faces an isomorphism. So in general, like you can't hope for better. And in, in general, yeah, an algebraic space is the best you can hope for to have such a general result. But yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. Okay, so moving on, and let me, uh, so we have this, I, I recall on the top, the definition of a course modulus space. It, these, it, just these two properties, um, but in practice, these conditions alone are actually not, uh, not always uh, sufficient for your, yeah, for your purposes. Um, in practice, we would, we desire stronger properties. So in, in, in for us, uh, if X is a separated DM stack, we will construct a course moduli space satisfying additional properties. So first is that uh, it's gonna be stable under flat base change. Two is that the push forward of the structure sheet is the structure sheet. And that uh, the map itself is proper. So maybe I should emphasize in particular, it's separated. And then, uh, and it's also sort of bijective. The definition implies that it's bijective on geometric points. And uh, in, this, in, in our case, it's even gonna be a universal homeomorphism. Wait, what that means is like, for instance, that implies that the induced map on the topological space maps bijectively to the topological space of the algebraic space. Part A, Jared. Uh, that, that that if you base change by a like a flat, uh, if you take an algebraic space X prime and a flat morphism, and then you take the Cartesian product, that this too should be a coarse moduli space. Yeah. Thank you. When I make precise statements later, I think I'm I'm clear. Uh, right. So I I just sort of wanted to say that yeah like. Well, one, it's not even clear what this is, that this is the best definition of a course moduli space, because in practice, you do want more conditions. Um, and maybe I should point out that in these conditions here is that actually A implies B. We first note that, you know, like if you have, just let, let's think about what the universal property of, of a coarse moduli space implies in the, in, the, in the setting that you take maps to A1. What this implies, a unique map here shows that the global sections of does that are, are equal. Because maps, yeah, because maps to A1, even for an algebraic stack, correspond to global sections. And, uh, but that's not enough just to conclude that the, that the push forward of the structure sheet is equal to the structure sheet. You need to know that if you take an Atal base change, that because this is also a coarse moduli space, we get that uh, we get that the global sections, that if I take the global sections of X prime of OX prime, which this is equal to by definition to the global sections of X prime, of the push forward of OX. Or maybe I should really write, this is, you know, the push forward, this is in the detail topology. So this is evaluating at this tau map. And we know that on the other hand, this is equal to X prime OX prime. And this is exactly the statement that OX, the natural map is a, is, is a bijection. Is an isomorphism of sheets.
And, um, and another useful property that will show, show up repeatedly is that you can construct coarse moduli spaces by descent, or you can check that, the, that both of these defining properties of a coarse moduli space hold after a tau or even flat base change. So uh, let's let this just be a, map, a morphism. Here, again, this is an algebraic stack and an algebraic space. And if, suppose we have uh, an a tau cover, It could even be FPPF uh, as, as such that the base changes such that if you take the base change of X cross X over XI mapping to XI is a coarse moduli space, then X to X is. And the reason this holds is just the descent. Uh, you know, the first property is just a condition on like geometric fibers. So that, that, that holds after a tau, that can be checked on a tau base change. And uh, the second property as well, you need to use the, a tau descent for morphisms. If you haven't, yeah. Uh, but I'll leave the details to you, right? But we'll, we'll, we'll use this. Any, any questions on, the, on these first properties? Does the definition uniquely classifies a course mod pins down one? I don't understand what you mean by like, maybe this is not the right definition. Like we need more properties because if those properties hold, don't we already have them because there's a unique one? Oh, it, 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 if you start with a separated delete for stack and, and you have a course moduli space, then it will satisfy all these other properties. But like really, it, it, like you can imagine more general algebraic stacks or delete muffer stacks that are not separated. And then there are some cases where they have coarse moduli spaces, but they don't satisfy these further conditions. And then there's even examples of delete muffer stacks that don't have coarse moduli spaces at all. Um, so is uh, MG separated? Is what separated? MG. The stack MG. M M oh, right. MG is separated. That's something that, right, this is a good, uh, a good point. Um, well, okay, I don't have, maybe let me return to MG later. Oh, okay, no, you asked. It, it, like, uh, we actually have enough now to show that MG is separated. Uh, so the, the Kiel Mori theorem will apply to MG once we show that. And so this will be our, our ticket to, to show the existence of a course moduli space for MG and MG bar. But we do need to, but I'm sort of hope, putting off the separatedness until we discuss stable reduction because the ideas are, are similar. Okay. Are there situations where, where Artin stacks or, or algebraic stacks have a, a course or a course moduli spaces? Yeah, that's a good question. Like, oh, so for, for instance, uh, like the, you could you could view the Picard stack, for instance, like if, if you're looking at uh, the class of like the, the stack parameterizing line bundles on a given projective variety, where you include the data of, of the automorphisms, and then this has a, a GM stabilizer because every, every, the automorphism group of any line bundle is GM. So you have a stack that has a, a GM stabilizer for that, at every point, and this does have a coarse moduli space, which is the which is the Picard scheme. Mm. And this is even, you know, a very particular, a particularly nice course moduli space that in that case, the map's not separated, but it, it, it's, it's called a, what's a, a, a GM derb, meaning that all the fibers are just PGMs and they're very okay, nice. Okay. That's okay, thank you. Or more generally, like if you look at the moduli stable vector bundles, the map from the stack to the, it does have a course moduli space. It's just rigidifying these, G, these GMs. Thank you. Okay, so I, I think the next uh, uh, the next thing I want to do is this is cover the existence of a coarse moduli space in the special case of finite groups, 
And this is sort of a classical story, but I, I want to spell it out again. And so uh, I've, I've so we're looking here's this the setup here is G is a finite group. Oh, that was the eraser. G is a finite group acting on an affine scheme. And the fundamental construction is this ring of invariants, AG. And there's nothing tricky going on because G is an honest, discrete, finite group. Uh, so therefore, it acts via automorphisms on the ring A. And it makes sense to talk about the invariant ring as all elements, all functions in A that uh, are invariant under the group. Right. And our first lemma, and, and the spectrum of the invariance is going to be, you know, our quotient in this case is going to be the coarse modulus space in this case. And so we, we're after understanding its properties, which is what these two basic lemmas establish. So in this first lemma, uh, we're fixing an Ethereum ring, and we assume that if A is finitely generated over R, then uh, then this morphism is finite and the invariant ring it's, itself is, is finitely generated. And this is sort of an important point here that, you know, like with these hypotheses, A itself is an Ethereum ring, but we're defining the subring of an Ethereum ring and a priori is just like, it might not be an Ethereum, it's something that you need to check. In this case, because G is finite, yeah, we have more at our disposal. In general, when G is arbitrary, this is like Hilbert's 14th problem, and when G is not reductive, the invariant ring is not always finitely generated. But this is sort of, the, yeah, an easy case because G is finite. Um, so yeah, let's prove this. Sorry, I suppose here G acts by R uh, algebra morphism in this lemma. Uh, yes, yes, AG has the structure, yes. Uh, I, oh, uh, I'm not sure what the question is. Yeah, like the the structure for, in this lab, for yeah, this lemma uh, to be true, uh, G should act by R algebra homomorphism. Oh okay. yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's right. And now I, I see the point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. G X. Let me just add this here. Uh, yeah, in this context, yeah, G X via R algebra homomorphisms on A, right? And or in other words the map from the spectrum of A to the spectrum of, that ensures that the map from the spectrum of A to the spectrum of R is G invariant. So everything lives over spec R. Yeah, thank you for that clarification. Okay, so, so to, to get started, the first thing we just realized is that, that AG to A is integral. And because if you take an element of A, then you can just find a monic poly polynomial. I just take the product over all group elements of X minus G A. And then because I'm taking the product over all elements, all these coefficients are actually gonna be invariant. So this is a monic polynomial uh, with A as a root. So that, that handles the integrality. And so we have, we're in the setting where R maps to AG maps to A. And we know that this map is finitely generated. Um, but that's, that ensures that AG to A is also finitely generated. I mean, A is a finitely generated algebra over its invariance. And because it's also integral, that implies that this map is actually finite. So this map is finite homomorphism of rings. And now we just use some commutative algebra. This is in a TM McDonald that because R is an Ethereum, uh, any sub algebra of a finitely generated one such that exactly with these hypotheses so such that A is finite over it um, is, is then plus AG is finitely generated as an R algebra. Okay, and now, now turning to the second lemma, what we 
we, we, this is establishing properties uh, of the invariance with respect to base change. So I have, I'm, I'm in the same setting as over here. Uh, and now I, I take an arbitrary ring map, AG to B, then G acts on this fiber product. And we have this sort of uh, diagram here that we'd like to understand, right? Uh, this is just the, this, this, this square is Cartesian by definition. This map here is G equivariant. This map is G invariant. This map is G invariant. And, uh, and so there's two, two properties that we'll use. First is that if this map is flat, then, uh, then B coincides with the invariance of the fiber product. And in general, it's, it's not always an isomorphism, but it's, this morphism is at least an integral universal homeomorphism. And, uh, but yeah, and these properties actually aren't, aren't hard. I mean, I'll do the first one. Uh, we, just, we just realized that the invariant rings, you know, sits as the equalizer of this diagram. Where these map, where one map is, yeah, sort of the, the, the diagonal inclusion, and the other map is, is given by multiplying by the diff, by, by elements of G, and then because tensoring is exact. Oh nope, I got that wrong. That implies that B sits inside. A tensor A G B where this is A tensor A G B. Since this is exact, this is exactly telling us that the invariance of this guy is B. Right. And then the second one I'll, I'll leave as an as an exercise. Okay, any questions on these on these lemmas? Okay, so now we get to, to the, 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 the special case. So this is our theorem in the special case of a quotient of an affine by a finite finite group. Um, so we we have we need to show that uh, this morphism is a coarse moduli space. And that satisfies these three other properties. And what we already know is it's highlighted here in red that we know that this inclusion from the invariance to the ring is, is a, a finite extension. And we know that the invariant ring is finitely generated over R. So in other words, we already showed one. The challenge is showing that it's a coarse moduli space. Uh, and so, the, the, so I'm going to break this into a couple steps. The first step is to show that the map is a, is a proper universal homeomorphism. And this X, this, this then implies that pi is bijective on geometric points. So to, to do this, well, we, we consider we have A maps to the quotient stack and this maps to the invariance. So we have this commutative diagram, and we know because G is finite, this morphism is finite. And we've already showed that this map is finite. And by construction, because in the invariance is a, is a subalgebra of A, this is schematically dominant. Um, and yeah, and, and in particular, therefore it's surjective. And so because it's surjective, you can then infer that this map is, is proper. So we get that essentially for free. And what we need to show is that pi, this map pi is injective on geometric points. Uh, oh yeah, because we already know, uh, we know, already know it's, this map is surjective. 
So, so it's, it's already, you can use this to yeah, conclude that surjective on geometric points. So we just need to show it's injective. And for this, it, everything comes down to, uh, yeah, geometric points. So we can assume that R is just K is algebraically closed. And we're gonna let X and X prime in spec A be two points, closed points, with distinct orbits. Right, but because the orbits are distinct, you know, there's they, they don't intersect at all. They have empty inter intersection. And these are two, the orbits are just are, are sub varieties of spec A. And, and you can always, whenever you have two disjoint closed sub schemes of an affine scheme, you can always find a function that is zero on one and constant on the other. So there exists a function f in A such that f restricts to one on this orbit and zero on the other orbit. Uh, and then we, we sort of yeah do this the same trick we always do with finite groups is you average over the group elements to force it to be invariant. So then this is an invariant property, invariant poly polynomial with the same property. And this, and the, this, the, the whole point is that, yeah, it's an invariant polynomial. And, you know, this invariant F prime is, is, a, is a function on the invariant ring. So uh, what that tells you is, is is uh, yeah that 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 the images are just are different because we have a function that separates them. Okay, so that, so since it's, it's injective, uh, it's actually therefore pi is bijective on geometric points, and uh, since pi is 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 proper, uh, the image of a closed set is closed. And so uh, the inverse map is also continuous. So that this implies that pi is a homeomorphism. And then, uh, but we need to show it's a universal homeomorphism. And so you, we, we, we now need to use these base change properties. So if you take an extension like this, let's just go back to see what we had written over here. We had sort of this nice uh, diagram. So if I just, so yeah, it, 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 we're in the setup, we have this diagram and in this diagram, what do we know? We know that, uh, that this map is a homeomorphism because this is the, this this is is the G invariance and the lemma told us that this was a homeomorphism and so that implies that this is also a homeomorphism which implies that this is a universal homeomorphism right so that was uh, so then we now know that handles part two. Right. Any questions before I move on to the next part of the proof? Yes, but how how do you know that uh, pi is a uh, bijective? I mean, it is surjective, uh, but uh, on geometric points, right? Yeah, it's. Uh, we, I showed it's objective on geometric points, and I think that maybe the point was that this map from spec A to spec A G. We know it's both finite and dominant, so that map's surjective, uh, and that allowed us to conclude that this map was surjective, and therefore that it's, it's surjective on geometric points. Of course. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Uh, no problem. Uh, okay. So yeah. So moving on.
So I'm like, okay, so we've done now step one and step two, and we've established one, one of the two defining properties of a course moduli space. Uh, we now are after the other defining property, namely that this map is universal, satisfies this universal property. This is, yeah, maybe the harder part of the argument, but. Um, and maybe, maybe before getting to this, I should just remark that, yeah, if Y is affine, then, right, then we have a morphism. If Y is affine, then we have a morphism from this, this global functions on Y to the global functions on X. But this is identified with the global functions of, of the algebraic space X. And so this, this map here defines X to Y because both X and Y are affine. So in the affine, when, when, yeah, we, yeah. When Y is affine is the easy case. So we need to argue, yeah, uh, two, Let's see. So let, let's start with the uniqueness. So let's suppose uh, whoops. Yeah, suppose let's suppose we had a diagram uh, where we have X. And we have y. And suppose we have two maps, h1 and h2. Uh, right, and so then we take let, let e be the equalizer. Of these two maps. So precisely it's 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 given by this fiber product over the diagonal of y. But sort of then then so e sits uh, inside x. Uh, it's and we know it's a monomorphism. And and sort of by definition of, of the equalizer, we know that this factors. So we have this factorization by the definition of the equalizer because yeah because we know yeah that after composition with this course modular space then these maps are, are equal right and we know because y is an algebraic space the diagonal is both a monomorphism and locally a finite type so that implies the same thing for the equalizer Okay, so what the, our, our upshot is that, okay, what do we know? Oh, we know that, yeah, that, that the goal is to show that E is equal to X, that the map from E to X is an isomorphism. And we know it's a monomorphism and locally a finite type. But this map uh, to X is, we know it, it's proper and schematically dominant. Uh, and therefore, we know the same thing about the map from E to X. It's also proper and schematically dominant. So we have a, so, so <laughs> wrapping up all of the properties, so E to X is, uh, so I guess the upshot is a monomorphism. It's locally finite type, it's proper, and it's schematically dominant. Meaning that the inclusion of, of uh, the inclusion from the structure sheaf to the push forward of the other structure sheaf is injective. And if you think about these conditions, that just these three, these three, the first three imply that it's a closed immersion. This isn't, yeah, this is just a standard in fact. That's not very, I think, not very hard to show. And but now because it's schematically dominant, that implies that it's actually an isomorphism. So we win.
Okay, and now, okay, so now we let turn to the existence. Uh, so the, let's see. So I want to I want to claim that the question of existence is a tau local on y. In other words, you know, we're in this setting on the left-hand side where we have where you know we're, we're given this map phi to y from x to y, and we want to construct a unique map from x to y. And the the point is. Because we already know that like that extensions are like if, if the extension it exists, it's unique. That allows us to apply a tau descent in order to make the question a tau local. So the reason for this is true is a tau descent and the universal property. Right. The point is that you know after if I know after an a tau map that I have a morphism from X to Y prime, um, then, then I, I can apply descent to get the, to get the proper map. All right, yeah, a lot of ingredients to this proof, but so, so the, the upshot here was that if it sets as a tau local, we can assume that Y is like the local ring in the tau topology. So we can, we can assume that, um, uh, Wait, give me one second. I'm, I'm slightly confused. Yeah, something. Oh, actually, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, it's, sorry. I don't want to show that it's a tau local on y. It's a tau local on x. Yeah, that that was confusing. The point. Let me. Let me. Yeah, because that's the the point was if you have an, an a tau cover. Of, of X and you have these morphisms, then you know on the double base change by the uniqueness that the compositions agree, which then gives you by a tau descent the map from X to Y. So a tau local on X, that's what we're using and that's what we're gonna use. And so that means that because it's a tau local, we can assume that X, which is the spectrum of the invariant ring is Henselian, even strictly Henselian. And, and we can also assume that Y is quasi-compact. Right, the reason for this is that uh, X itself is quasi-compact. And uh, therefore the map from X to Y factors through a quasi-compact open in Y and so we just replace it by that. And so we can assume that yeah, everything in the, in the picture is, is quasi-compact. And so maybe I should move on to the, this, oh, this page here. So where are we here? Okay. So we have these reductions that, that AG is strictly Henselian, and we know that uh, Y is quasi-compact. And we're in the setup that we have X, we, we're given some map to Y, and we want to construct a map like this. And since y is quasi-compact, we can choose we, we, we can choose y prime affine we can, in a tau presentation. Okay, and I think I need a little more space. And so if I take the base change, let's just complete this diagram. I, let's take x prime here. This is a fiber product. And we also know that we have a cover here, spec A, and we have this morphism. And let's just take this to be the base change. So this is our diagram. Um, and because, okay, 
we know that this map is finite uh, and this is Henselian. So that implies that this is also Henselian. So in fact, the only, the only two properties that we'll be using about Henselian rings is that, uh, is that there's, it's stable under finite extensions and that any etal cover of a strictly Henselian thing is, has a section. Right, so in this picture, this is a tau, this is a tau. And, uh, right, oh, oh yeah, here's the point. <laughs> that, oh, right, so because spec A is Henselian and we have an a tau, a, a tau morphism, strictly Henselian even, then there's a, a section S. Um, which then descends to a section of this map. And now, okay, where are we? Uh, y, y prime is affine. What do we know here? Uh, so, so we're gonna use the, okay. Since y prime is affine, uh, and uh, there, there's, there exists a map like this, uh, sorry, I'm getting confused here. This is not as tricky as I'm making it seem. Um, Oh, okay, okay, yeah, I think I got it now, sorry. Okay, let me back up. The point is that I, I've used the Henselian property and, and because I have this etal extension here, there's a section. So there's a section here. So, the, the, so under the section, X maps to X prime, maps to Y prime. And now Y prime is affine. And we already know the affine case that there then exists a map like this. A unique map like this, and therefore we get the composition to Y. All right, that, that, that wraps up the proof. Why did the section S descend here? Do you need, that need to know something like it's G invariant? Yeah, you need to show it's G invariant. I think the point here is everything. Um, yeah, I think you need to. It, yeah, I'm going to use a similar argument later. I mean, it's an extension over of, of an etal representable map. So the section itself is an open immersion. Um, and in fact, if y prime to y is separated, uh, then the section is also a closed immersion. So you can think about this as just a component of the other one. So you get sort of the G invariance uh, for free, if I'm not mistaken. Let's, re let's return to that maybe later. That's a good, that's a good question. Yeah, there's a, I mean, there's a lot of details. You, you can ask yeah, details of every single aspect of this argument. Um, yeah, let's return to that. Okay. So, all right, so, I, I, so now that we know the, 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 the affine case, let, let me just sort of re repeat our strategy. You know, we're trying, we're after a coarse moduli space, uh, for, for X. I think I need, uh, yeah. So our strategy is to, to construct a, cor a course modulized for, 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 for X. We, we use the local structure result to find this etal map. Here we have a coarse moduli space. And the way we, let's call this W. And, uh, and so the natural thing to do is to consort, consider this base change here, W over W, W, yeah. And because this map is also affine, this itself is, is gonna be spec, Spectrum, like a, a, 
an affine scheme mod the stabilizer. So here you also have a coarse moduli space. And we have two maps. And these, these are given by, yeah, by the universal property of coarse moduli spaces. And what we need to know is that this is an etal equivalence relation. Because once you do that, you, you will, we can then take the quotient as an algebraic space and argue that that's the coarse moduli space for the stack X. And so this, the central question here is, so if we have an affine morphism, morphism of affine schemes that's G equivariant uh, and a tau, When is the quotient map a tau? And maybe like okay, and uh, I'm 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 going to give a, a precise statement in a, in a moment, but let let's just argue maybe heuristically. To, cut, to try to see what, what properties uh, yeah, should we impose. And let's just assume for this heuristic argument that everything is over an algebraically closed field. And let's let X be in spec A. Uh, and the, sort of the fact, this takes work to, to show and my, the argument actually will not be using this fact. The argument is it will be in fact like a little bit simpler. Uh, is that if I take the invariance of A, if I, if I take the completion of A, of A at X, and then the stabilizer group will act on that, that, that is identified with the invariance of A completed uh, of AG along at the image of X. And so if, if F is a tau at X, what that tells you is that the, that their completion of the local rings are isomorphic. So in this context, like A hat mapping to B hat, where, where B hat is the completion of B at the image of X, that, 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 that that's an isomorphism. And we wanna know, you know, when is this quotient map? Let's call that F, F bar, then, F bar is a tau at the image. Uh, well, if and only if that, if and only if the, the induced map of its local ring, so the completion AG completed mapping to BG completed is bijective. But by this fact, we have identifications. And so that tells us that what we need is that the invariance of the completion of A at, the, invariance, at the, the stabilizer of X should be equal to the invariance of B completed, yet yeah, the invariance with respect to the stabilizer of the image of X. And so the sort of the upshot here is if these stabilizer groups are identified, uh, we win because the A hat is equal to B hat. And if the groups are equal, then their invariants are equal. And we get that the map on completion on the quotient are equal and that's a tau. So there's a sort of a heuristic argument to expect that you know, if the stabilizers are equal, a tauness should descend to the quotients, right? And that's the content of the next proposition, but I'm gonna state it and prove it quite differently. Right, so the statement here is, uh, okay, it's exactly sort of in this setup that we have a finite group, we have a G equivariant map, uh, and we have these two key assumptions, yeah, here, that the map is a tau and it induces an isomorphism that stabilizes. Then the statement, because this is of a, of a local nature, then the statement is that, uh, that there's a, that after shrinking spec AG, there's an open sub, subscheme W, even affine, 
such that the induced mass from W is, is a tau, and uh, the, the outer square here is Cartesian. And in fact, in, in the context that we're going to use it, is in fact, we have more properties. So the, the, maybe let me just, yeah, is, is that if in addition, these two properties hold at all closed points, then that we get globally that the map on quotients is a tau. So then, then we get that this map is a tau and it's Cartesian. Okay, so let me let me sketch this proof because the, the yeah the, the proof is, is going to be similar to, to the other one. It's just going to be sort of a, a reduction using properties of Snellian rings and a tau descent. And so, uh, so like in the last case. I have, uh, yeah, I want to argue that the question is a tau local around uh, the image of Y. So he, here maybe we have uh, our points X mapping to Y. And uh, the question is a tau local. Um, Maybe since I'm taking longer than I thought, maybe I'll skip that that that, that step. But that it, it is a tau local, and what that tells us is that BG we can assume that, that this is strictly Hanselian. Uh, right, and so. Right, we're in the context, let me use, use this diagram again. So, so, so here's the strategy. Uh, so we, we know, I mean, we could, we're assuming now that this is strictly Henselian. So that implies that B itself, because it's finite over its invariance, is also Henselian. And uh, and then because this is the similar argument before, we're assuming that this map is a tau. And because B is Henselian, you have a section. And then you argue that if this section is G invariant, in this case, I think it's even easier than the last case because this section is an open and closed immersion. Uh, and, and now, well, what are we trying to show? Well, we want to, we want to show that we can shrink spec AG Zariski locally so that the, the induced map on quotients is a tau and the diagram is Cartesian. But this tells us what we can do because the S is an open and closed immersion. This is open and closed. So its image, if I just take like the image of S, this is an open and closed substack that's isomorphic to spec B mod G. And then this has tautologically the quotient, which is PG. And this map is not only a tau, it's an isomorphism. And so a tau locally, yeah, so we, uh, yeah, we, we handle it. Is this okay? It's kind of a sneaky proof because maybe all of the, the details are on the reduction to the Henselian case. Wait, can you, I'm sorry, that was a little fast. Can you say that one more time? Uh, like, can you like go through I guess I yeah, sure. Want to stagger one more time. Thanks. Right. Let me. Let, yeah. Let me. Let me try. That. So, the first step of the argument is 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 to assume that uh, 
that BG, that that this that the spectrum of BG is um, is is strictly Henselian. And in other words, that the question is a tau local here. Yeah, this argument it's not it's yeah it's not that hard. I should maybe I should point that like the, the, the fact that it's a tau local is not that hard. That's standard descent theory. But then you, you do need to know some properties of strictly Henselian rings, and you need to know that basically the same way that you go from like like in the in the scheme case about properties of the local ring in the Zariski topology to then spreading it out to an, an actual open neighborhood is, is is of the same flavor here. So you need to know that if it holds for the if you can argue over the strict concilium, then you can actually argue over an honest and you could spread it out, spread it out to an honest tau cover and then use descent. But assuming that we're okay with this reduction that BG is strictly concilium, then uh, well, then we're sort of in a that, yeah, it's sort of in a much easier situation because the uh, because uh, yeah, B is finite over BG, so spec B is Henselian, and I'm given an a tau spec A that is a tau over spec B, and so and then you and then yeah, it's a, a tau cover over a strictly Henselian ring. Therefore, there's a section, and then we use this section in order to identify an open and closed substack of spec A mod G that's isomorphic to spec B mod G. And this is the open that we use to shrink in order to ensure that the map on quotients is a tau and the diagram is Cartesian. Okay, thanks. I think, I think hearing it one more time made it make more sense. Yeah, yeah there's a lot to it. Uh, all right, so now I want to go, so we fi finished all the ingredients we need and I want to sort of wrap up the proof of the Kiyomori theorem. Uh, so here, I have a lot on this, on this page here, but the three things on the right-hand side we've already proven. Uh, what we're after is, this key, is, is on the left-hand side. This is what we're trying to prove. That if you have a delete Mumford stack that's separated, then there exists a coarse moduli space with all of these additional properties. In particular, the coarse moduli space is separated. And there's on the right hand side, we have the three ingredients that will allow us to prove this quite easily. Basically, this, 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 this here is the special case of, of a quotient stack. And these two will allow us to reduce to the special case. But let me spell that out in, in detail. Yeah, I think I'm, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll finish at 12. Yeah, may, maybe I'll need another 10 minutes because I do want to wrap this up. Uh, and I think we have all the ingredients. So let's, let's do it. Okay, so let's assume, okay, this was stated when S is an algebraic space, but you can reduce to this case, the case where S is affine. In fact, this reduction argument is, is along the same lines of the entire proof that I'm gonna give now. So the yeah, reduction step should maybe be done after the entire proof. And now I argue that the question is a risky local on X. Because if, if I have, if I can cover the stack with open substacks uh, and I have coarse moduli spaces for each of those opens by the universality of, of, uh, of course moduli spaces and the fact that induces an isomorphism on their underlying topologies, I can then glue them to form a global course moduli space. And the fact that the, our, our argument is showing that we can not only do it Zariski locally, but a tau locally. And so we, it suffices. So what this means, it suffices to show uh, that for a closed point, that there exists an open neighborhood of X 
with a coarse base. And so let's let, let's let's choose a representative of this point. A representative of X and let's take it to be a geometric point and then set G to be the stabilizer of this point. So it's a finite group. And the local structure theorem gives us this map that's a tau affine to x and a point w of mapping to x. And we know that the automorphism group of w maps bijectively to the automorphism group of x. And so what the, the, the heart of this argument is showing, we need to show, but let's call this condition star. So we need to show that this condition star holds also in a neighborhood of W. Or given that it holds for at a single point that that induces an isomorphism of stabilizer groups, we need, want to know that it actually holds in, a, in an open neighborhood. And this is where the separatedness hypothesis is coming in. Right? This is So x separated, well, what does that imply? It implies that the diagonal by definition is proper. Uh, or in this case, it's because it's delete Mumford, it's, it's even, it's, it's finite. And then if we base change by the diagonal again, we get the inertia stack. And so we know this map is finite. And so what we do is we consider sort of the map on relative, sort of the relative inertia map that You'd have, you have the inertia of W over W. And this maps to the pullback of the inertia of X. All right, with this, oh no, I, that's a typo. All right, and now because this is the base change, right, this is the base change of uh, IX to X. And this map is finite. This map is, is finite. Okay. Let me discard this right hand part now. But it actually turns out, this is sort of an amazing Cartesian diagram. It turns out that, that, this, that if you consider the fiber product here, that this, this square is Cartesian. So I, I should point out two things. Uh, first is that this, let me first spell out that, what is this map really doing? This is like a relative map. This is a map of group schemes over W. And, and such that for like a, a, a fiber, such that for a point, a geometric point, the fiber is the induced map on automorphisms. So this is sort of the right map to study. And the second point is that this, this, this is a Cartesian diagram, which will help allow, allow us to identify properties of this morphism of group schemes. The first is that you note that you know, W to X is affine. So that implies that this map so affi maps are, are separated uh, and this map is representable. So this map is closed. It's a closed immersion. Um, but it's also a tau and representable. And this implies that the diagonal is actually an open immersion. So this map is both closed and open. And so therefore this map is also closed and open. In other words, it's just a union of connected components. IW, the inertia of W is just a union of connected components. And therefore its complement is also a union of connected components. In particular, it's closed. And so if we take this projection to be P1, take P1 to be the image 
take the image of under the complement. This is a closed subset. And because, because uh, the inertia was finite over X, this map is finite. And so this is a closed subset of W. And it's precisely where the map W to X is not stabilizer preserving. And moreover, we're given a point W, which we know it is stabilizer preserving at that point. So that, therefore, if we just throw away this whole closed subset, we, we, we arrange. So the upshot is that we can arrange that W to X is stabilizer preserving. And we can even arrange, because we just need to show uh, there's an open around our, we can even arrange that this map is, is subjective. This is a risky local question. All right, so now, now we're in, in, in a good shape. Yeah, and this was really where we used that one key hypothesis where the, that the stack is separated or that the inertia, really that the inertia is finite in order to argue that you can shrink uh, Zariski locally to ensure to, that it's stabilized and preserving everywhere. If you drop the separated condition, this fails and, and this argument fails and the result is not even true. Right, so going back to the proof, now, now what we have is we have our stack, we have W, and we have a surjective, a tau, affine morphism that's preserving stabilizer groups. And we have a coarse moduli space, W, which is spec AG. And I'm gonna, now I'm gonna go to the groupoid level where I take this fiber product and, as, and this has a coarse moduli space. Again, this is this is just an affine mod a group, the same group. And so this has a coarse modulus space R, and I had two maps. And now since W to X is stabilizer preserving at all points, so is these two projections. From the, from the stack R. Um, and, and it's also, a, a, yeah, a tau and affine. So we're in the situation where that lemma told us that the, the two diagrams, the two squares are, are Cartesian. And that these maps, so we get that both of these maps are a tau and both squares are, are Cartesian. So the, the upshot was that that this induced map R to, to W, this map up is a is an Atal uh, groupoid of even affine schemes. Um, in fact, to get the groupoid structure, you need to argue one more level, right? Because you need this inverse, you need this composition, but you have because everything here is sort of uh, was sort of by base change and you have all of, uh, you know, all of the arrows and this sort of simplicial diag simplicial stack you get from taking these base changes, you get the same thing by using the universality uh, for maps and, and of course moduli spaces downstairs that gives you the groupoid structure and then the only thing you need to check. And I, I won't do this because I'm running out of time is that the diagonal is a monomorphism. And since it's a monomorphism, we could take X to be the quotient. So that gives us X here and we have a morphism. And then you, you, and then you just finish the proof using a tau descent. descent. Descent will give you this morphism 
Um, and then descent will also imply that this is Cartesian. And then we, we use the, the fact that uh, coarse moduli spaces can be checked tau locally. So we get that this is a coarse moduli space and you get uh, all of, yeah, you can check all the other properties too using descent. Maybe the one thing I, I should, one thing to point out, maybe the one, yeah, Y is X separated itself. And this just follows from the, the general fact that here you have, we know that this map is proper and we know that the stack itself is separated. So you actually get that this is separated for free. 